On screen, his performances were explosive, energetic, and wildly inventive. But Robin Williams' brilliance in front of the camera concealed a private sadness. The highs are highs and the lows are lows. And there's nothing sadder than when a comedian is by himself. They painted him as the sad clown. That last evening I spent with him, he was, he was completely sober, but just most uh, troubled. When Robin Williams passed away, his millions of fans around the world were in shock and disbelief. While his family and several of his friends had some insight on what was going on, no one knew the full story. And no one would find out the truth until months after Robin passed. Before I get into the story, I just want to put out a disclaimer. Please do not send any hate to Robin Williams' friends and family or anyone else mentioned in this story. This video is meant to report on what happened and give some insight on the situation. Also, this is the second part in a series on the situation. Please wait until the end of this video before forming your opinion on what happened. Now let's get into the story. When the news of Robin's passing reached the media, many of his friends and fans were shocked and devastated. In the documentary Robin's Wish, Robin's neighbor John Hepper said, I felt tremendous remorse and guilt that, gosh, I should have done more. Robin's longtime close friend Stanley Wilson said, I know something must have been terribly wrong for someone as brilliant as Robin to just, you know, jump ship like that. Late night host and comedian David Letterman was vacationing in Montana with friends when he heard the news. As a fellow survivor of heart surgery, Letterman said, It just didn't make any sense to me. After what these guys did for me, they opened me up, they took my heart out, they put me on a heart-lung machine for 42 minutes, and then they put your heart back in and they stitch you back up. After people have gone to that trouble, the last thing in the world you're going to do is ruin it by killing yourself. To Letterman and his friends that day, it seemed unfathomable that a man whose astonishing talents left them feeling inadequate had decided his life no longer had value. Robin could fly Letterman said. It was the diametric opposite of what his life was. It was almost like, you're never going to suffocate this energy. And then, at the end, he chose to do so. The suffering must have been inestimable. Billy Crystal and his wife Janice were on a European vacation when the news broke. They immediately made the long journey back to the United States to mourn their friend at home. As they passed through the airport in Rome, Crystal was struck by the tableau presented by the international newsstands, where every cover of every publication bore a picture of Robin's face. For that moment, Crystal said, there was no in Iraq or Afghanistan. There were no there was no trouble in the world except that Robin had died. Every paper, everywhere, the front page. He was a joyous spirit that people loved and trusted. It didn't make sense. In the immediate aftermath of his passing, there was a lot of media speculation about the nature of his death, with many reports focusing on his past issues with depression and addiction. Many people who didn't see Robin's recent struggles were confused by his passing. His dramatic roles were more urgent, and his comedic roles were tainted with sadness. As the film critic Bilge Ibiri tweeted with uncommon precision that day, you start off as a kid seeing Robin Williams as a funny man. You come of age realizing many of his roles are about keeping darkness at bay. Two days after Robin's passing, speculation was only increasing and spiraling out of control, ranging from theories about his death being a to wild speculations about his sobriety and finances. Johnny Steele, one of Robin's friends, said they thought he just committed for something related to unhappiness, drugs, or depression. And of course, none of that is true. Robin's widow, Susan Schneider Williams, released a statement. Robin spent so much of his life helping others. Whether he was entertaining millions on stage, film, or television, our troops on the front lines, or comforting a sick child, Robin wanted us to laugh and to feel less afraid. Since his passing, all of us who loved Robin have found some solace in the tremendous outpouring of affection and admiration for him from the millions of people whose lives he touched. His greatest legacy, besides his three children, is the joy and happiness he offered to others, particularly to those fighting personal battles. Robin's sobriety was intact and he was brave as he struggled with his own battles of depression, anxiety, as well as early stages of Parkinson's disease, which he was not yet ready to share publicly. It is our hope in the wake of Robin's tragic passing that others will find the strength to seek the care and support they need to treat whatever battles they are facing so they may feel less afraid. This was the first time anyone in Robin's inner circle had disclosed closed Robin's diagnosis, and it seemed to provide some clarity to his death. It was hard to imagine Robin 
himself over financial problems or sustained depression. But it was easier to understand why Robin would not want to live after receiving a diagnosis that would, over time, shut down his body and brilliant mind. As devastating as his choice was, it was now framed as a decision between immediate pain and a lifetime of mental decline. But to some of the people who knew Robin best, some things weren't completely adding up. Comedian Bobcat Goldthwait, one of Robin's close friends, said at his memorial, I'm not a doctor, but something happened to Robin a few years back. Again, I am not a doctor, but something affected his brain. In October 2014, Susan was called into the coroner's office to go over Robin's autopsy. During that meeting, the coroner delivered a startling revelation. They sat me down and said, essentially, Robin died of diffuse Lewy body dementia. According to the Alzheimer's Association, Lewy body dementia is a type of progressive dementia that leads to a decline in thinking, reasoning, and independent function because of abnormal microscopic deposits that damage brain cells over time. For the first time, Robin's family had a diagnosis that explained much of Robin's strange behavior in the last years of his life. Neurologist Douglas Shar of the Wexner Medical Center at Ohio State University explains, there's a protein that is normally useful in the brain and it starts to accumulate abnormally and it's toxic. Where it builds up, it can cause cell loss and cell death, and therefore that contributes to certain conditions. The onset of the disease is extremely gradual, Dr. Shar explained. The proteins build up very slowly. One day, you're normal. Then you're having a little bit of motor problems, then little cognitive issues. Those who suffer from it may first notice memory problems or physical stiffness, but over time, they often undergo massive personality changes. They experience sleep problems and, in some cases, hallucinations. They may become increasingly physical, even violent, and their mental acuity can flicker on and off like a light switch. Bruce Miller, the director of the University of California San Francisco's Memory and Aging Center, reviewed Robin's medical records and spoke in Robin's wish about his condition. He said Robin's specific case was extremely severe. Lewy body dementia is a devastating illness. It's a killer. It is fast. It's progressive. In looking at how Robin's brain had been affected, I realized that this was about as devastating a form of Lewy body dementia as I had ever seen. Almost no area was left unaffected. It really amazed me that Robin could walk or move at all. The disease is devastating, but even more so when you realize that Robin did not have a diagnosis. He did not know where these new symptoms were coming from. The disease becomes progressively irreversible, unstoppable, and always fatal. Always fatal. There's a high risk of patients ending their lives, especially when the patients are young and before the worst symptoms set in. Edward Huey, a neuropsychiatrist at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons said, if you're young, if you have insight into what's happening and you have some of the associated symptoms like depression and the hallucinations, that's when we think the risk of is highest. As for why Robin was still able to function relatively normally, Walter J. Koroshetz, the director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, explains, The thing to know about the brain is that it's not static. The connections are always changing. We call it neuroplasticity. So you have someone who has a stroke and part of the brain is damaged. It's not coming back. Some of those patients get completely better because the brain rewires. It has this resilience and the determinants of resilience we don't quite understand, but high intellectual abilities to begin with seem to go along with that kind of resilience. In this section, we'll analyze some of the common symptoms associated with diffuse Lewy body dementia and how they appear to manifest in Robin's case. These symptoms are the same as the classic signs of Parkinson's disease, slowed movement, rigid muscles, tremor, and shuffling walk. Robin exhibited several of these symptoms, most notably the tremors and locked mobility in his left arm. These symptoms were likely why Robin was initially diagnosed with Parkinson's. Though Robin may have been exhibiting some of the movement problems associated with Parkinson's disease, Dr. Galvin said there was more going on, and that more made it suspicious, and that more was above and beyond Parkinson's. Because of these overlapping symptoms though, patients are sometimes diagnosed with other conditions, including Parkinson's disease, before Lewy body disease is properly identified. I don't fault physicians for misdiagnosing it, Dr. Galvin said. It's not that easy. In Robin's wish, Dr. Miller says, in Robin's case, there was a focus on his movement, but I think internally for Robin, this was only a tiny part of the symptoms that he was experiencing. Another very early feature of dementia with Lewy bodies is visual hallucinations. They often believe that these hallucinations are real, so for Robin, learning that he had 
Parkinson's disease was not enough. Because Lewy body dementia heavily affects the nervous system, many bodily functions are not properly regulated, like blood pressure, sweating, pulse, and the digestive process. As a result, the patient can experience constipation, dizziness, and falls. Robin experienced several of these symptoms, including constipation, stomach cramps, indigestion, and profuse sweating. Patients with Lewy body dementia often experience cognitive problems similar to those associated with Alzheimer's disease, like confusion and memory loss. Robin exhibited many of these symptoms, like being unable to remember lines on the set of Night at the Museum 3, and when he experienced delusions similar to when he believed his friend Mort Saul was in danger. Most notably, he put several of his watches into a sock and delivered them to a friend for safekeeping the night before he passed away. Patients can also have rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, which causes them to physically act out their dreams while sleeping. Robin did not sleep well during the last months of his life. He would often be awake and wanting to discuss his delusions with Susan, and when he did end up sleeping, he would do so fitfully. Doctors told Robin and Susan to start sleeping in separate bedrooms, and when that detail was released shortly after his death, many tabloid publications interpreted that as a sign his marriage was troubled. Some patients can also experience drowsiness, long periods of staring into space, long naps during the day, or disorganized speech. Robin often experienced periods of staring into space, particularly in his final months. Some patients with Lewy body dementia will experience a loss of motivation. In Robin's case, he was often turning down invitations to see friends, go to parties, or even speak to close confidants on the phone. As well, one of his earliest symptoms was not wanting to go perform at a local theater close to his home. Finally, it's common for patients to experience depression during the illness. Robin had been open about his struggles with depression throughout his life, and many news reports shortly after his death focused on his depression as a possible reason why he died. While depression was certainly a factor in his passing, it's also important to remember that psychology and neuroscience are interconnected within the brain. People believe that there is psychology and then there's neuroscience, and they're not the same. But in fact, it's all related to how our brain circuits are working. I think in this country, there's a big problem that mental health and neurology are seen as separate. In fact, it's all abnormalities and brain circuits when, when your brain is not functioning to allow you to be a fulfilled human being. There's a tendency to blame people for their behaviors and their illness, and a certain mindset around disease that people are responsible for their own disease. They aren't. I think there's a blame-free world. Just like when someone has cancer, you don't blame them. With this diagnosis, Robin's previously unexplained symptoms finally started to make sense. It also provided some insight as to why Robin died. Sean Levy, the director of the Night at the Museum movies, said, It no longer feels loyal to be silent about it, but maybe more loyal to share without shame, without secrecy, that, yeah, this guy was hurting. He was going through something he didn't have a name for yet. And it doesn't bring Robin back, but it does give clarity. However, even with this diagnosis, his friends are divided on what actually happened on the day Robin passed away. Was he consumed by a delusion, or was he lucid and aware of what he was doing. Comedian and friend Rick Overton said he had an idea on what the cause of his passing was. Without yet having heard all the details, Overton already knew the cause of Robin's death. It was a death of a thousand cuts, he said, but these were massive cuts. Each was a sword blow. For a guy who's known for his freedom and mobility, to find out he may not have that anymore, his facility of speech may not be his anymore, access to a quick thought might not be his anymore, all his trademark things, everything he has identified his personality with, it's like, holy sh what are you going to do? All of that said, Overton added, he would not have abandoned his family when in his right mind. He would have endured all of that, unless something shorted out. He wasn't Robin at that point. He stopped being the guy we know. That part shut down. Comedian Stephen Pearl said, I don't count his death as a because it wasn't him that did it, as far as I'm concerned. It just really angered me that it would happen to someone like him. Why couldn't this happen to an Stephen Haft, who produced some of Robin's films, including Dead Poet Society and Jacob the Liar, said Robin would not have knowingly caused his children pain. I don't, to this day, believe he intended to never see his children again. After the diagnosis was released to the public, Bobcat Goldthwaite said, 
He died from Lewy body dementia, but the world wants it to be about something else. Depression, drugs, career, relationships, etc. He had a disease that attacked his brain. My own opinion is that that's what actually changed his perception of reality. But Billy Crystal has a different perspective. As Billy Crystal explained, I put myself in his place. Think of it this way, the speed at which the comedy came is the speed at which the terrors came. And all that they describe that can happen with this psychosis, if that's the right word, the hallucinations, the images, the terror coming at the speed his comedy came at, maybe even faster. I can't imagine living like that. Thinking back to their conversations after Robin was told he had Parkinson's disease, Crystal said, he did ask me a lot of questions about Muhammad Ali. When when did he start to get bad? When did he go silent? When did this happen? He was seeing himself. This was where I'm going to be. I don't think he could live with that. Crystal added, My heart breaks that he suffered and only saw one way out. This is a heartbreaking situation, and even with more insight on Robin's passing, there is no real happy ending. Immediately after Robin's death, many people's image of who Robin was became tainted, that the joy and happiness and kind nature hid a dark side, and what they saw of him wasn't real. But the Crazy Ones creator David E. Kelly explains why that's not true. I think it's important that the truth comes out because there were so many affirmative things that Robin stood for, and we want to believe in all of them. We want to believe in him. And there's a danger that his could occasion people to think, oh, well, he, he wasn't what we thought he was. We didn't know him after all, but we did. A completely new variable was entered late into the equation of Robin Williams's life, which ended his life. The Robin that we watched all those years, the man who put himself out there, the man who went overseas to entertain troops, the man who would entertain the crews on the sets, the man who hugged and held on to his friends, that was very real. If you would like to learn more about Lewy body dementia, you can check out the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And if you would like to donate to the Lewy body dementia association in Robin's memory, or in the memory of a loved one, you can do so on their website. We'll have both of these links in the description below. What do you think about this story? Let me know in the comments below.